This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to episode 298, and this episode is a particularly special one for me, as I may, as I think our listeners know, I'm a big fan of learning about leadership, and I've been a huge fan of our guest today, Dr. Randall Stutman and his company, Admired Leadership. We talked about uh, Randall, I guess, a couple months ago because I went to a five-day leadership retreat in Utah led by, by Randall. And Randall's someone who's been studying and exploring the behaviors and routines of extraordinary leaders, and that is what he is all about, and that's what his company is all about. And as I said at the time, the experience to be with Randall and his team for a week was truly incredible. He's a, 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 had an amazing career learning and observing leaders. And it's about the behaviors of leaders, not necessarily the leaders or the star power of the leaders themselves. And that's what I find so engaging and fascinating about this. And I, I've been following Randall for, for many years and admired leadership, as has Tessa, your sister, Bentley. We're both you know, kind of the in-house junkies of this stuff here at PWL. And that week had a big impact on me. Just, you know, things like how you make a decision, how do you give feedback, how to have a meeting, how to get to the root of a problem. And it goes on and on. How to be an admired leadership, how to create followership. So I, um, we work with, full disclosure, we work with admired leadership here on our team. So over the years, you guys have heard us talk about different firms and people are helping us um, help people and admire leadership has uh, been working with us for a few months now on a regular basis so we are big fans but through that I asked if Randall would be willing to come on and join us to talk about leadership and the the spin we put on it was we talked about decision making but we also got into how would my leadership in this framework can be important in working as a financial advisor and with your financial advisor so that was the the angle we took with it um, Ben, I know I'm rambling on here, but any any thoughts that you have? No, I mean, like you said, we've been we've been using the admired leadership learning resources as a as a team at PWL, and and they're incredible on uh, decision making, uh, definitely, but on leadership more generally. It's really really high quality information, and uh, I think we got a lot of that from Randall in this conversation as well. So Randall has been a principal advisor to more than get this two thousand senior executives. 400 CEOs, uh, his work has taken him to the White House, to West Point, to, to Olympians. I mean, the list goes on and on. Pro golfers. It's, it's pretty wild who he has worked with in the past. And again, it's not about the stars. It's about how these people have made uh, and acted in a way that their leadership can be admired. That's what I find so, so engaging about this. Um, yeah. So with that, I think we can just go to the interview. Ben, any final comments? No, I, I think this is a, a good, broad-reaching conversation on leadership and decision-making with All applications right. to financial advice relationships. All right, let's go to our conversation with uh, Dr. Randall Stutman. Dr. Randall Stutman, it's so great to welcome you to the Rational Reminder podcast. Privilege. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, great to see you again. And again, thanks for, for doing this. So off the top, Randall, what is the typical approach to leadership development? So the way most people come at leadership development is, and, and rightfully so, is you have to understand who you are, like your preferences, your personality, your traits and tendencies, because without that as a foundation, it's pretty hard to improve or get better. And so um, understanding and being more aware of the kinds of person kind of person you are and um, who you've made yourself to be. That's kind of foundational. And then the next piece is to understand uh, um, who other people are, right? How your team or your, you know, uh, clients or how, how they differ from who you are, what drives them and, and how they orient. And usually they're from different generations and experiences and ages and right, you know, backgrounds and the like. So, so understanding them and then how most people approach leadership development is, learning how to adapt and flex to those differences based on your foundation, right? So, you know, one person that you, on your team needs to be motivated by challenge, by a swift 
kick in the butt by high bar that demotivates somebody else on your team. Somebody else on your team needs the recognition, needs praise, needs approval. So you adapt and flex based on individual differences, right? Based on how you operate and how they operate. And so that's how most development works. It's not how we do things and how I think of things, but that would be the most traditional way of developing yourself as a leader and, and as a person. And I wanted to start there because I've heard you talk about this at length before. So can you explain why that typical approach is actually doing some real damage? Well, in its foundation, there's no damage to it. It's just when people get so involved in the diagnostic, the assessment of who they are, and then they take that so seriously as to treat it as fact, as, as reality, um, and that this is the kind of person I am. I, I can't do that other thing. You know, um, like I'm, I'm this type of a, of a leader. And so therefore I won't even try to improve on this other area. It lets them off the hook. It, it actually puts them in a box. They, they allow themselves to stay in a box and, and, and it basically robs them of accountability of actually getting better. Right. So I want to tell you a fun story for me. Um, I have a longstanding client and, and he has a London team. Um, and, um, one day I, I facilitated an offsite for his London team and one of his uh, closest uh, London associates came to me and said, I'm so glad Paul is getting coaching, which is kind of a backhanded compliment, right? Um, and I said, oh, really? I said, have you ever, ever worked with anyone? Um, and he said, oh, yeah, about 10 years ago, I, I had a coach. And I said, was it a good experience? He said, fabulous experience. And I said, tell me about it. And he said, well, he gave me one of those assessments. And I said, oh, well, what was the assessment? He goes, I don't remember the name of it, but I learned that I'm on the 99th percentile of excitable. And I said, well, that strikes me as kind of odd that that was useful to you because usually if you're in the 99th percentile of something, you already know that. And he says, oh, I knew I was excitable, but now I have the proof that I was like one of the most extremely excitable people there was. And I said, well, how was that useful to you? He said, I came right home and gave it to my spouse. And I said, look at my test score. And she said, yeah. And he said, I'm excitable. You need to learn how to deal with it. And so that's the classic example, right, of funny for me. But, you know, it lets people say, this is who I am, not who I've made myself to be. This is who I'm not willing to change because, I, you know, I'm, this is baked in my DNA. So if there's any harm, it's not usually that that's the, that's the problem. But there is a harm or a consequence that's negative to the, what I call the psychological or individual difference view. It would be that. It would be that people get locked into their assessments and then they live those assessments through the future and limit their ability to grow, right? Mm -hmm. It's not what I think is the biggest problem with that approach, but it definitely is one of the problems. What does it mean to be an admired leader? So admired leadership and admired leaders, you know, how I came to that um, connotation was I was studying some exceptional leaders and it was the word that everybody used for them, you know, so I admire them for this, I admire that. So I started calling these two particular leaders that I was studying admired leaders. Now, realizing, by the way, that that puts a target on people's back and and there's only one place to go from admired and it's definitely downward, not upward. Like there's no place, there's not a higher pinnacle for a leader than being admired. Hmm. So, but but what it means to be admired is really that the people around you respect you, trust you, um, and hold you in such high regard that they're willing to follow you. They believe you, um, you know, they're, they're willing to, to, to walk into traffic for you. Um, and you're skillful enough to be able to, to have that relationship with them, to create a, a connection with them that's very real and authentic, but also skillful enough to gain results. So what you find is the most admired leaders are not only extraordinary results leaders, but they're extraordinary followership leaders too. That is, they can create great followership. People want to be around them. People feel differently when they're engaged by them about themselves. Um, and people follow them from place to place. And yet they have these tremendous decision-making and other skills that enable them to generate great outcomes, great performance. So admired leaders have two qualities, results and followership, and in extraordinary ways, and they're really rare. I mean, it's just very, very rare. Most leaders that get promoted throughout an organization, um, Ben, um, they're, they get there because of the results. They don't get there because of the followership. Um, and they generally are very jealous of followership leaders, by the way, that people that are able to make that connection because they don't like the fact that people are popular and more popular than they are who aren't able to create the results that are sustainable or that sustain the organization. 
So it's both those things. It's those two qualities. It's really rare. Um, and most leaders that we look at and we would say iconically, this is the great leader in the world away from politics, which is just a strange leadership context. Um, most of those leaders are results-based leaders. Rarely do we see someone that has both sides of things. And so we call them admired leaders. Can you talk, Randall, about the benefit of followership? Yeah. So, so listen, you and I both know that if you make a great decision, it doesn't matter if I don't have any subscription and buy it. It just doesn't matter. I can make a lousy decision because it's not going to get executed, right? So I waste the quality of what I produce if I don't have subscription and buy-in. And so creating followership and having followership skills about how I motivate, inspire, build relationships, create team, create cohesion, you know, those kinds of things, they are the, the power of great leaders because without them, nothing else really matters. So, so they, the idea of why followership is so important and why the skills of followership are so important is in order to really execute and get things done. And um, you can't produce change. You, you can't um, uh, you know, uh, implement a great decision. You really can't do much um, unless you have followership. Now, most of us have enough followership to get execution done, but we don't have the kind of followership where people are just raring to go that have mm. the energy or commitment and, the, and then so that's why followership is so important is is it's it's the differentiator for how we we really produce the kind of high performance and outcomes that we want. How, how can everyone in an organization be an admired leader? I'm not sure they can. Uh, and I'm not sure you that's the aspiration. Like, uh, oh. like, listen, if somebody thinks of you as admired, you don't control that. That's an evaluation mm -hmm. other people give you. I, I, I think it's great that you you would strive to to have that level of respect and trust but i wouldn't be after the label right mm. i'd be after being more effective on an ongoing basis like every day just be more effective and get better generate more respect more trust more more of a view that your competence is one that benefits not just you and the organization but that other person or that team and and then eventually as you continue to mature and be seasoned and experienced and get more and more done in the right way some people will come to respect you, even admire you, and that's great. But yeah, I'm not a big fan. I don't try to teach people how to become admired because I think that's kind of that would be like you know teaching people how to how to you know be um, you know special, right? It's like um, you're special is because other people confer you that specialness. There's nothing innate in you that makes you special per se, right? Hmm. But can everybody in an organization at some level be a leader? Sure. I mean, in fact, I think that's always the case, no matter what. The way that I come at leadership and define it is leadership in this most simple form, as well as its most complex form, is making situations and people better. Right. That's it. So anytime I try to make a situation better by, by having a higher quality decision or by uh, reducing the level of conflict that exists between people or uh, making it so that there's more clarity, whenever I do that, I'm leading. And same thing with people. If somebody needs to be comforted and I comfort them. Somebody needs to be encouraged, I encourage them. Somebody needs to be challenged and I challenge them. I'm leading because I'm trying to make them better. It doesn't mean I'm going to succeed. And it doesn't mean that my intentions are always pure, which is a different issue altogether. It does mean that I'm attempting to lead. And I can lead without authority, without position, without title, because anyone can make people and situations better or make choices to do so. And the more often you do it, the more often you're leading. What I find fascinating is when you teach that to young kids, for example, teenagers, um, you teach it to people that are not empowered, and they realize they're leading all the time. They just need to do it more, more intentionally and more, more actively because they want to be in the game. They don't need the authority or title or position, and it opens up an entirely new world. By the way, you and I both know there's all kinds of people with position and title that are called leaders that do a really lousy job at it, right? Hmm. Just because they're leaders doesn't make them you know, special people. It doesn't give them and entitle them to anything special. So all of us are leading as much as we want or as little as we want. I, I encourage everybody to make more leadership choices, make the choice to lead more often and, um, and to everyone's benefit. Love, love it. Let's shift to decision-making for a bit. How can or perhaps how should how an organization sees itself, you know, things like reputation, values, brand, mission. So how should those characteristics influence the decisions it makes. So every great leader we've ever studied is value driven. They, they know their values and they try to align and be very congruent with them. That makes perfect sense. 
The same thing applies to teams and organizations. If you don't know what you stand for, it's very difficult to have consistency and certainly difficult to raise performance to a level that's sustainable. So, you know, job one is what are the things we're going to choose to stand for? And by the way, we can't stand for 50 things. We can only stand for a handful. doesn't mean we don't value other things, but there's just a core set, right? And the majority of organizations that go through this, it becomes a human resources exercise. It, it's like a consulting exercise where they generate a bunch of bromides. You know, like we stand for like we're client centric and we're, you know, we're about profitability, but we're also about collaboration. You know, we use these general words. And in fact, when you go into most organizations, you look at the reality, not just the aspiration, but the reality. It tends to be more specific, like take an idea like integrity, right? Is it integrity that you value or is it respect or is it transparency or is it fairness or is it equality? Like, like get to it, right? But once you know what those values are, then, then they should shape every decision. They should shape how, who you select. They should shape who you promote, who you recognize, how you recognize. They, they should shape every single thing in your organization. Now, very few people and organizations have lousy values, right? There's not a right set of values, right? Right. And so you can drive to greatness from just about any set of values if they're held with in high esteem and they're congruent with almost everything we do. They should inform strategy. They should inform everything that's going on in the organization. And that's how great organizations become great. A follow-on question to that. As you said, values are often... Um, very broad terms and sometimes aren't concrete enough to help you make an actual decision that might be much more strategic or tactical in nature. What do you, what do you do with that? Do you have to kind of pivot to a, a specific corporate or business strategy to make that decision? Uh, maybe, but, but what I would suggest before you have to make that full pivot, um, Cameron, is I would say what you're doing really is, is you're taking that value and you're asking a question with it. If I hold this value, what it, what displays that? What demonstrates it? If I hold this value, is there a more likely good answer versus a not a good answer? Like, what's the question that I can use from that value to help me make this choice or this decision? Right. So I don't. You don't have to say, okay, it's respect. Like, how, not just how do I apply respect here, but if I'm being highly respectful, for example, and I was trying to make respect cornerstone of of my leadership in this in this situation how would I go about doing that, right? What what would count as respect here? And if you ask good questions from the values, you'll oftentimes get a really good answer. If if at that point you don't, then yeah, maybe you need some other information or some other in, um, uh, influence over that decision, but that would be rare in my experience, right? Um, values should be able to drive um, and influence almost every decision that gets made at every level. Hmm. Can, can you talk about how consensus decision-making can hurt an organization? So in the last 50 years or so, almost all organizations have moved toward consensus. That is, the value of inclusion and what expect, expectations people have about being included and being heard and having an influence over the decisions that affect them has continued to rise and it's not going away, right? So leaders, whether they like it or not, um, have had to become more inclusive and have had to create more collaborative environments. And the natural decision rule in that environment would be consensus, right? Now, consensus is not that everybody agrees. Consensus is that there's a few people that really believe strongly about something and everyone else believes in those people or believes they can live with it, right? So there's nobody that has to stand in the way of that consensus. The problem is with consensus is in some organizations, it is a very inefficient way of reaching a decision because leaders I identify too many stakeholders. They don't have a real way to get past the, in the impasse of an individual that stands in its way. It's an art form in a lot of organizations to keep a decision on a table to eventually kill it by just by neglect. Um, and so consensus can strangle the speed and, and really um, – the urgency of making decisions it can even make prevent a decision from being made if it's poorly used and it's poorly used in lots of organizations. Like, so because we're operating by consensus, it takes us way too long to reach a conclusion. And in other cases, we never reach that conclusion because some people are uncomfortable and we allow that to occur. So consensus is a wonderful way of making a decision. You have to have the goodwill to do it in an organization that is 
people that believe in each other and trust each other's and defer each other's judgments and subject matter expertise. But even when you have it, if it's not um, engaged correctly, it can be it can strangle an organization's ability to decide, right? Mm. And so, so that's pretty common common pro, um, phenomenon. Um, you know, people that are listening to this, some of them are going to go, oh, that's interesting. But some of them who live this on an ongoing basis go, that's exactly what happens in my organization, right? That we never reach the decisions because we're always trying to reach consensus first and we never reach perfect consensus. So things just don't get decided. And what a shame because we're missing opportunities. We're losing losing all kinds of initiative, right? And like, And it happens in more organizations than you would think. The key there, though, Randall, is the drive for perfect consensus. Your definition of consensus, I would say, is not commonly understood. Uh, yeah, but even if you so, even if you believe, and, and by the way, mine mine is not mine. It's the academic, you know, the decision making way of thinking about a decision rule called consensus. So it doesn't come from me. Um, but that idea that consensus is champions with everyone else who can agree, that's what consensus is, right? Um, but even if you operate, um, Cameron, from the rule that consensus everyone agrees, that just makes it even harder, right? Not, not you know, it makes it more difficult to ever reach a conclusion. Imagine getting 30, 40, 50 people all who agree 100% with not only the decision, but all the tactics below it. Really, really hard to achieve, right? And it only takes one or two people to say, um, that's not my self-interest, that decision, right? I, I you know, that's been not my, been my experience. And then they ask questions and stand in the way of that consensus and they hold everything up and they right. hold the, the organization hostage, basically. Yep. Okay, so if we take take consensus out and say that's that's maybe no good. It, oh no, consensus speaking, is great. You just gotta do it differently. For sure, okay, yeah. Well, so that, I think that's kind of the, the question I wanna ask. Who, who should be making decisions if it's not a consensus mechanism? So, so no, I, I think I think operating by consensus is 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 going to be the norm going forward, and I, and I and I I don't I mean I think it's the way you create collaborative and build subscription and a great collaboration in organizations. So I'm not at all opposed to consensus. I and, you know I think it's I, I actually I was delightful to watch organizations society move in that direction. Um, mm -hmm. It's much more person centered and and all kinds of advantages. But again, the subscription idea is is a big deal. The key is this, right? So Ben. Every major decision that has to be made has to have a key decision maker. I have to have somebody mm -hmm. who's a decision maker. Now, if you operate by consensus, the decision maker is just one person at the table. It's just one person who has a view. Maybe they're the most senior or most experienced person, so maybe their view establishes the foundation of what counts as a great decision. Maybe they lay out some guardrails, give some guidelines, whatever else. But then at that point, their opinion is just like everyone else's. The only time they become a decision maker is when we can't reach consensus. When we can't, then they have to make the call. They have to listen to everybody's arguments and say, at the end of the day, I'm the decision maker. I was hoping we could reach consensus. I was hoping the team would do that. It, we can't. We've done. We've, we've set out some timeline, and now I'm going to have to make the call. And, um, and this is the call I'm going to make based on the objective hearing of everyone's views. If you simply identify a decision maker, and everyone knows, by the way, that in three weeks' time is an example, like, if we don't reach consensus, they're going to make the call. Trust me, you're going to get a lot more consensus, and you're not going to be held hostage. So it's a really simple change, but most organizations haven't accepted it or, or don't do it. Again, you don't have to do that for everything, um, but for major decisions, you don't want to be held up by a small minority voice that is against something. And somebody has to make the call, and because we don't identify a decision maker, everyone's making the decision together in consensus, and that's the problem. So it's not hard to solve. And then when you do it that way, consensus is your friend. It's it's a wonderful decision rule um, hmm. relative to organizations. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. So consensus is not bad, but there needs to be an ultimate decision maker assigned. Yeah. Somebody has to be able to break the logjam when there's a logjam, right? And if okay, you don't yeah. do that, then the consensus is, your, is a problem. Which there's is lots of other trust. decision rules. Yeah, yes, absolutely. There's lots of other decision rules, by the way, um, but consensus is the is the most popular and, and most active and, and rightfully so in, in today's world. Um, I, I don't see it, you know, like I can't even imagine or even conceive of the next decision rule beyond that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we've moved away from unilateral decision-making, autocratic decision-making, mm -hmm. um, decision-making by vote, which is a very strange thing mm -hmm. in some organizations. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we've moved toward, but, but, you know, the ultimate irony here, and I don't want to give everybody a headache, but the ultimate irony is, you know, how does your organization even decide what decision rule is going to operate for? Hmm. Like, 
because you need a decision rule to even make that decision. So if I decide we're all going to operate by consensus, do I do that by consensus? Yeah. Which means I'm already <laughs> applying that rule. Or do I do that by majority vote? Well, why would I only vote on one on our decision? Hmm. Like who? how do we decide that we're going to vote? Right. And so the ultimate paradox is you, you, somebody, this is back to the decision maker thing. Somebody has to make a call that says, here's how we're going to decide what decision rule we're going to make. Right. Hmm. And that's a unilateral call. Okay. And it's always the case. There's no way to escape it. And now, again, I don't mean to give anybody a you know vertigo in the process of thinking about that, but I always find it funny because people say, well, you know, we, we've chosen to operate by consensus. And I'll say, well, you know, how did you reach that, that decision? Was it by consensus? Yeah. And, you know, it's just too funny, right? That is fair. That is yeah, funny. You have to be somebody like me to think that's funny, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing, too. Uh, okay, so we talked about where consensus can be problematic. Can you talk about other shortcomings that you often see in decision-making processes? Oh, sure. Right. So, so if you look at the decision-making literature over the last 50 years, and so, and by the way, it's gotten fabulous, like it's gotten so much better. Um, but generally, you know, it focuses too much on, on certain biases that decision-makers have to, to the benefit. I mean, we know there's, you know, more than 25 major biases that decision-makers have. And again, back to that psychological view, if you understand your biases, you're you might be able to offset them to some degree. But there's a bunch of things that we know that are really enhanced decision-making in a big way. Um, just take the idea of options, right? So we know that any team, not by, when, when I say me, I'm using the generic we across the literature of everyone that studies decision-making, of which I'm one person. Um, not my forte, but I certainly spent a lot of time thinking about it and, and reading about it. But we know that any team that operates um, and tries to make decisions the more options they identify early on, the more likely it is that they're going to they're going to land on a really good option. So too many, too often, um, what happens in teams is we have two or three options. We don't get creative beyond that. We think we're constrained by those options. By the way, they may be very good options, but they may not be. And we've limited our ability to think creatively and to, and to look for other win wins and all kinds of other things. The better thing to do early on, of course, is is to identify the problem and then think about all the possible options that we have to approach that problem or opportunity for that matter. And then once we have that list, then to, to evaluate those options. And what you're going to find is just simple, more, simply more options produces better quality decisions, right? You know, how simple is that, right? But, but if you ask me what gets in the way of decision making, the biggest problem is too many times we actually solve the wrong problem. So we're making a decision about something that's not the problem. And that is because we haven't spent the time to identify the root cause of the issue or the problem or the opportunity. And so as a result, um, because we haven't spent that time, we haven't admired the problem long enough, we haven't identified the root causes or, or issues underlying it, we therefore presume what the problem is and we solve it, but it's the wrong problem, right? And so therefore we realize we still have the same problem we had before, even though it was an elegant solution we put it in place it had the, the consequences, implications, symptoms of that problem haven't gone away. And that's because we solved the wrong one. Right. And that happens a lot. Hmm. Yeah. That's, that's so important. We, we, we did an episode a while ago with Ralph Keeney who studies decision-making and he talked a ton about uh, the points he just made. Okay. I'll have to look at that one. Um, he's, 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 he's really smart. So I'm sure I can learn something from listening to the podcast on that. I missed that one. Sorry about that. Uh, Randall, are there some decisions that should be made quicker and some that should be made slower, especially given the number of options you're bringing to the table? Sure, sure. So you can divide decision-making into two different buckets, decisions that can be reversed and decisions that can't, right? By reversed, I mean easily reversed, you know, pretty soon. And other ones that you can't reverse them, they're not very easily to revoke them once you put them in place, right? Right. you know? One, once we make the decision to buy the house and we actually put the money down, it's hard to revoke, right? So, so, and once we decide on a new strategy and, you know, we, and we, we bake that into what we're going to do tactically in our plans and operating budgets and like, it's really hard to revoke it. Right. So you're going to treat decisions that can't be revoked or not reversed very easily, very different than, than decisions they can. Right. So, so naturally you're going to spend more time with more analysis, with more energy, with more, with just more uh, um, engagement around um, decisions and not just because they're important. Some some decisions can't be revoked that aren't that essential, but they still can't be revoked. So you're going to spend more time on those kinds of decisions than than the decisions that can be reversed. 
and you're going to take you're going to treat their decision process um, a little bit more seriously. You're going to engage it more, you know, with with a lot more vigor. That's just natural, right? I think, but you can, but it's not so natural that we automatically do that all the time. So I always advise people to bust up decisions in terms of those. Can just ask the question: Can I? Can you reverse this decision? Can you revoke it? Would it yeah. be not that hard to change course? And if you can change course, then you know, make your decision, but don't fret about it. Right. I mean, you know, go through your process and and then figure it out and land on something. And better you act more quickly on those kinds of decisions. Right. Why? Because there's not that big a consequence. I don't mean the consequences aren't real, but we can reverse them if we need right. to versus the other kinds of decisions where we can. Right? Again, you guys are treating me like I'm the decision making expert of the world. I'm not. OK, I just happen to study leaders. So. I don't know why we're on this decision stuff, but nonetheless, keep going if that's where you well, want to go. No, we're gonna we're gonna shift right now, Randall. I want to get into some of your thoughts around our world in the in the business of financial advisory services. Okay. So, of which I'm a client, so keep going. Excellent. Uh, how, how do you think a, a financial advisor could or should act like an admired leader? Well, if you think about leadership and making situations and people better, they are leading their clients, and if they're not leading their clients, something's seriously wrong. Right. So they should be thinking about who I am, what I am, um, but also, you know, what is it that is my particular situation and how do they make it better? And and how do they make me a better partner in the process? And, you know, what are, based on what I need and what I think I want and so forth and so on. Right. So so getting people heard, understanding their risk appetites, all all the normal stuff that everybody on your, you know, your listeners know. But but using that work in order to intentionally right um, um, help you know improve and grow not just the assets but the person themselves the relationship also that's a pretty important part of all of this because at the end of the day this is all about relationships um, you can you know you and I both know you can do great work and not, not maintain a relationship and and what a waste of time and energy so most of your advisors are more in the relationship business than they think and 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 they're a lot less in the financial um, advice business than they think Right. And um, and I know that's that would be controversial, but I'd argue that one comes before the other. Right. If you're not any good at building relationships, you're not going to grow a, a incredible practice. Um, at the same time, you're not going to grow that incredible practice unless you offer some pretty sound advice, too. Yeah. So so one's more is, is requisite, but it's not sufficient, if that makes sense. Hmm. Are, are there any admired leadership behaviors that you think might be unique to financial advisors? No. I mean, relationships are relationships are relationships, and just like leadership is. Um, and the best, you know, behaviors are universal. They apply in all cases. That doesn't mean that there aren't some things that um, that you would do specifically as an advisor. You would do it other places, but you might emphasize it more as an advisor, you know, kinds of things. It just depends, and it depends on who you're dealing with. Let me, let me tell you, like, I'm in the business of, you know, promoting you know, what I do, right? And, you know, I run a large organization of coaches, right? And, and, um, and, and, and I've learned this a long time ago. So I deal with a lot of very high level, high profile people, CEO types and everything else. And so, you know, it might surprise you, but when I go into org in conversation with those people, um, which probably are not dissimilar in terms of the client set, you know, set of your, of your listeners. Um, one of the first things I do when I get in those environments is I try to find a place to disagree. Like, and people go, really? I mean, because I've been taught, like, I want to be likable. And I go, I want you to be likable, too. I want to be likable, too. But I want I want people to trust me. And and anybody, right, you know, when I when first, if you disagree with someone, right, and, and really make a, a good and sound argument, right, uh, as to what, like, who does that but somebody that's willing to tell you the truth? And, and by the way, that tends to be my brand. I tend to be very candid. And, and, and you know, I don't smash people on the head with truth. I, want, I don't want to be offensive or unpalatable with the truth, but I, I always want to be more candid because that's my real role as, a, as an advisor coach, mm -hmm. right? So I go in there looking. Now, sometimes I can't find it, right? But, boy, if I can disagree early in a conversation with a, with a prospective client, I go right for the disagreement because I want to prove to them that they can trust that I'm going to tell them what I really think. Now, that doesn't work every time, but it works more in my advantage. At least I've convinced myself it does. It works more in my advantage than, than the downside, right? And I build really trusting relationships with people because of my candidness. Now, that's me and that's how I approach it. But it wouldn't be surprising to me that a lot of your advisors should be disagreeing with their with their potential prospective clients more than they actually think. 
Now, some some people are smiling when they listen to it because they go, I disagree all the time. I'm dealing with people that don't know what they're talking about, right? <laughs> um, and, and yeah, that's that's the simple way of disagreement. But disagreeing on something truly, you know, of substance, where you have taken a position where they have also taken a very strong position and saying, hey, I want to disagree agreeably, by the way. I want to say, you know, you have, you have a right to your position. I, I want to say, hey, that makes sense. I understand where you're coming from, but here's what my experience says, and this is kind of how I see it. And, and so I have a different view than you do, right? And do that early. Now, that's just one example. I'm not arguing that that's the tactic or strategy of everything, but I can think of lots of things that advisors might be doing relationally that might be a little bit different than we do in most relationships. Like I'm not establishing a, you know, in, like if I'm trying to find, you know, with new friends, new new neighbors, I'm not, I'm not looking for a place to disagree very early. Okay. I mean, that's just not going to you know go well. Right. Um, but I would with prospective clients in, 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 in that case. So there are some things we do with clients that are a little bit different. Um, but how you add value, the kinds of ways you build trust, you know, how you congratulate, how you how thankful and grateful you are. Some of the things you do to in, to include people. Those are all universal things to building great relationships and they work no matter what arena you're in. I think your disagree point is so, uh, so so insightful, especially, and I assume you do this with your clients, you link that disagreement to the goals they've come to you to try to solve. Is that a correct assessment? Usually, yeah. Not always, but usually. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. so you know, again, I'm just trying to build trust through candidness, right? I mean, listen, I, you know, I deal with, with CEOs and some of the most powerful people in the whole world. Anybody, everybody in the world wants to tell them what they already want to hear. They find it refreshing. Not all of them, right? If somebody's willing to disagree and take out and stake out some ground, even if they don't agree with it, they go, okay, here's somebody that I can trust, right? That's going to tell me the truth. Now I have to assess whether you actually know what you're talking about, which is a separate issue altogether, right? But again, relationship before content, right? So many things in our world, there are items to do in all the different parts of someone's financial world. This becomes this massive checklist of stuff that has to get done. So it'll lead us back to your earlier comments around it's important to be, um, to have great followership to inspire people to get that list done. Do you have any thoughts around, you know, having a list to help people and to motivate people to get through that list of to-do items? Yeah, I mean, you know, checklists are really valuable because they help people organize, remind things, remember things. I mean, I think checklists are great. Um, They also help great consistency and the like. I think the the key is, though, not to create them and treat them as so much of a task that they become the focus of your conversation or relationship. That's all. I think if you have to get stuff done, you have to get stuff done, you know? Like, we go to the grocery store all the time. We have, a you know, a grocery list. But the grocery list is not the focus of our day, right? It's not. It doesn't become the mainstay of our conversation. And it's not even really what we do spend all the time in the grocery store doing, right? Yeah, we're, we're checking off our list, but we're also looking at all kinds of things and you know, thinking about what we're going to cook and, you know, lots of other things, right? So you just can't let the, the, the checklist dominate, right, and become the over overarching focus of, of the conversation of the relationship. But the checklist is really important. I don't want to go to the grocery store and go, without the checklist, I forget all kinds of stuff. I have to go back four times. What a waste of time, right? So so I want a good checklist and I want to be able to work through it. Just don't let it take take things over. Don't let it, don't, don't let the checklist drive you, mm. right, is probably another way of saying it. Sticking with the theme of financial advice relationships, what, what traits of an admired leader do you think a financial consumer should bring to their relationship with a financial advisor? Well, I think they should want a real a mutual, mutually influential relationship. I don't think it should be one-sided. Um, li- listen, you know, I should back up and I should say, not every client should, and prospective you know, client should be your client. Like mm-hmm. there's all kinds of different clients in the world. If you're somebody that, you know, doesn't value relationships, then go find other people that don't value relationships. You'll have a great time, right? Um, but I want somebody, you know, I would want somebody, if I was on the other side, to A, I would want to be heard. And then is, you know, I want to listen to you, but I want you to listen to me. I want to build a relationship with you. You know, I want I want you to build a relationship with me. Um, if I'm a client on the other side, I, I want you to explain the things that I want to know, but I don't want you to over-explain the things I don't, right? I mean, too many people, like, you know, we don't we don't go to to the, you know, the, we don't drop our car off to the service people and go, can you explain to me exactly what you did and, and mechanically like how that all worked, right? And it's because, no, no, that's what I'm paying you to do, right? I'm paying, now tell me, you know, by the way, the bill's bigger than I thought it was going to be. So you must've done some really great work, but 
But but at the end of the day, I don't want all your theory. I don't I don't need to know. So are you good at judging what I should want to know and what I need to know and what I what I would value? Or are you just dumping on me all this stuff to make me impressed by how much you know? Because I don't need your theory. If I have all your theory, by the way, I can do what you do. And why? by the way, there's way too many people that think they can do what your advisors mm. do. And that's part of the problem, right? And so I want you to find the right clients, the clients that resonate with you or that are consistent with your values. But when you say to me, so what should those, those clients do? Um, it's a hard one because it depends on what, what I mean, they're going to be different kinds of clients and they're going to have different needs. The, the real question is, are you, are you finding the clients that, sh that should be looking for you too, right? Because there's a match in heaven there for everyone. And, and there's going to be enough clients, by the way. But if you take on everybody, you're going to waste a lot of time and be a very frustrated person because there's going to be people that, that you know, do things, ask you things that you go, why, are, why, no, why am I doing this, right? This is not normal. And the reason is you found the wrong person, right? And they found you. And, they, and by the way, you're the wrong person for them too, right? So, so you, you, need to, you need to find the clients that, that want to find you and then satisfy them in the way that they want to be satisfied. I have a question for you on goal setting. Do you have any thoughts around the best way for a couple to come to agreed upon financial goals? Wow. Um, they need a target, right? You know, you don't start from like the, I think if there's any advice I would give is if you start, from, the more you start from a blank piece of paper, the harder it is to reach, reach agreement. So it's easier for people to, to riff off of and respond or react to a position, a proposal, a target. And so give people a target as to what goals we think might be reasonable and start from there. And once you have that target, then you'll know, once you have that proposal and there's disagreement, now, now the key is to find what underlyingly, what's the, what's the underlying reason for that disagreement? And then we can start working, walking it through. Listen, here's what I've learned, right? A lot of disagreement has nothing to do with the content. It has to do with the relationship. Hmm. And so when the relationship is, is not, ideal or problematic it gets expressed through that that goal setting process so people fight over goals not because they don't agree with the goals they they have a problem in the relationship and they're expressing their disagreement uh, over the goals and they're, they're using that as the forum by which to say you know our relationship is not where i want it to be trust me when your spouse says to you you know you don't put the, the top of the toothpaste back on the toothpaste tube it has nothing to do with the toothpaste tube or the top. It has to do with, do you hear me? Do you respect me? Am I a partner in the, in, you know, or do you understand all the work I do around here? It's a relationship issue. It's not about the toothpaste, okay? But they'll use the toothpaste in order to bring it up. That happens at goal setting a lot too. What do you think is the best way to deliver feedback in an advisory relationship? Oh my gosh, you got a couple about five, six hours for me. I knew it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many important things to giving feedback. But but listen, all right, so so let me give you a, a broad, this will be a little bit abstract, but it'll be worth it by the end, I hope. Right? Go for so, it. So when you think about giving feedback, right, the very reason we call it the word feedback is because it comes from a place of power, experience, expertise, right? So let me give you some feedback, right? Let me give you an idea that, you know, is important for you. And criticism falls in the same bucket. Now, I know very few people that prefer or like criticism or feedback. Like if I came to you and say, hey, Ben, I have some feedback for you. I don't know you. Well, wow, I can't wait to get it, right? Very few people are like that, okay? Now, imagine the feedback message I was sending you is that you need to be more diligent of understanding where the marketplace is in any given moment. I'm just making that up, okay? Now, I can I give you a little feedback that you're not as diligent as you should be and you need to have more discipline in understanding the macro environment, okay? Now, that produces resistance because it comes from a place of power. It says, I have the experience, I have the expertise, I'm the one with the knowledge, right? And that's why I'm giving you this feedback. By the way, I'm your advisor and so I have the power, okay? Now, that same message, I can reduce power by offering some advice. Advice is the same message, by the way, but it reduces power. So I can say, can I give you some advice? And you say, sure, what's your advice? Now, advice I can accept or reject, right? And it comes from your experience, but it doesn't come from your authority. 
And so same message. Can, my advice is that you have a more macro-oriented view and take more discipline to understand what's going on in the marketplace. All right, great. Now I can reduce power again by calling it a suggestion or recommendation. Like, can I make a suggestion? Sure. What's your suggestion? My suggestion is that we learn, that you learn, and, and I help you learn how it is that you can have a more macro view and so forth and so on, right? Now, same message, except I simply reduce power. Anytime power is high, people resist it. As power gets lower, people resist it less. All the advisors should not be in the feedback business. They should not be in the criticism business. They shouldn't even be in the advice business. They should be in the recommendation and suggestion business. Hmm. And if they start thinking like that and acting like that and describing things like that, they're going to find that people have a higher degree of receptivity. Now, that is so basic in the way I think about things. It it doesn't even bother me to give it to your whole audience, right? And so, so I'm happy to talk about that. Now, we know so many cool things about feedback and how, how the best instructors and teachers and leaders and coaches give feedback that, you know, I really could spend a tremendous amount of time and tell you a lot of the magic that we've learned over time. But just starting there is so important. Just reduce your power and and start describing things more in recommendation and suggestion, and you'll find that people respond very differently to you. So interesting. So we are all in a similar business. We provide advice to people. Do you have a th thoughts or experience around how often you should connect with the person you're helping to build out an effective relationship? Yeah, great. Yeah, so there's no exact right answer, you know, Cameron. I mean, you know, your instinct is probably more than less, right? And so people that aren't able to sustain relationships generally don't have enough cadence and frequency of contact, right? And so the question, though, is through what mediums and, how, and by, through what, by what value am I going to connect with you, right? So, so i give you an example that is a personal pet peeve of mine. So I have insurance. You know, I have multiple insurance agents. I live in different places. And every one of them is, is, is works in the same organization. They don't know that I have other agents, right, probably. And they all call me once a year, all right? Actually, they call me twice a year. The first time they call me, they, they always piss me off because they call and wish me a happy birthday which is on their checklist, right? Now, I don't know these people, right? So, and by the way, birthdays are not a happy moment for me anymore, okay? So the idea that somebody I don't know calls me and wishes me a happy birthday is enough to put cream cheese right in my shoes. Like, I just want to do anything to get away from them, right? And if it weren't for the fact that I actually coached the CEO of this particular organization, I'd probably change insurance companies just for that reason, right? How dare you treat me so unrelationally as to put me on a checklist and then do something that is highly relational in a way where we don't have a relationship, right? So as you can tell, I get energized by this. Yes. Right? But the second thing is they call me once in a while and they'll say, hey, can we review your policies? And again, I don't know you, right? And yeah, it's not a bad idea to review my policies, but wouldn't it make a lot more sense to have a little bit more cadence with that to say, hey, by the way, we noticed this in your policies. And by the way, this is something, this is a trend going on in the marketplace. And, and then by the way, right, we're in your neighborhood. And if you'd like us to stop by, hey, and by, right. And so then all of a sudden you say, can we review your policies? I go, hmm, this is somebody that actually cares about me. This is somebody that's thinking about my business. This is somebody that's thinking about my insurance, right? This is somebody that wants to have a relationship with me and that is actually engaging me, right? So I think your instinct is cadence and frequency matter. I'm going to guess that it happens to ha have a minimum seasonally. In other words, if I don't, if I'm, I have no contact with you at all for a whole season, all I get from you is, is you know, something in the mail from you, a statement, or whatever else. We've gone way too long for you to sustain our our relationship, um, and so probably. And my guess is it's a lot more um, frequent than that for most people, depending on the size of their clientele and so on and so on. But you can't sustain a relationship and keep a conversation alive unless you have at least a quarterly cadence. To, to real connection, to real conversation. Not just a hello, not a Christmas card, right? right? Not a, you know, here's a question for you. Here's my e-letter. By the way, e-letters are the most ridiculous things in the whole world, right? Nothing could be less relational than an e-letter, right? Let me put me on some mass distribution and tell me all the things that, you know, in some some amalgam, amalgamated form you've told, you know, you're telling to the rest of the world. Like, you know, again, we don't have a relationship. I'm just, just I'm just a check check box on a list for you, right? So, <clears throat> you know, again, e-letters, 
great as long as they're personalized, as long as on the top of that e-letter, I call you and want to talk to you about it or I emphasize one paragraph in it or say, hey, please don't miss this or whatever else. And I include a photo of, you know, my my most recent, like, you know, um, vacation where you and I have been before, whatever it might be. But by themselves, horrible. They, they basically kill relationships. So the social media too, but that's a whole different issue. You, you made such an interesting point that when someone does something relational, like wish you a happy birthday, when they don't actually have a relationship with you, that's actually detrimental to the, I guess, non-existent relationship in that case. Yeah. In, in fact, in any, if I didn't already have a policy, we would call it stalking, right? Okay. Uh, context but, matters, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And so, mm. you know, like, again, if somebody you don't know all of a sudden says, hey, you know, can I help you, you know, mow your grass? You'd be like, okay, whoever you are, get as far away from me as possible, right? If that person says, hey, I don't really don't know you, okay, we've never really met, but I would love to invite you to my organization to learn more. You go, that's great. Like, okay, let me back up slowly, all right? Yeah, it's called stalking, right? Nobody wants to be stalked, okay? You have to have real conversation. Relationships and conversations are so um, tightly connected. They're basically the same thing, Right. And so I have to find a way to create a real conversation with you. And, and once I have it, I can't let it die, right? I have to sustain it. But I have to create it. And, and until I have that foundation, anything I do that's highly relational is going to um, be very awkward. Hmm. You spoke to elements of this, but how would you define a successful relationship with an advisor? It's mutual. Both parties are influencing. Both parties are adding value to each other. Um, both parties are curious of each other, right? So it's not just curiosity on one side. Um, both parties are engaged in common goal, obviously, right? And we agree to what that goal is. And both parties have a commitment to the longevity of the relationship. Like this is not short term. We both expect to have this relationship over a really long period of time, right? And we act accordingly. That's what I would expect. A question about, uh, from a family perspective, do you have any thoughts around how you would motivate kids to get involved in the financial decision, financial planning process? Well, first you have to ask them good questions, right? I mean, you know, that's, that's where it would start, I would guess. Again, it's not my business, but if I was trying to get kids involved, I, I would want to elevate their status in, in our conversation, and I'd want to ask them a bunch of questions and what they know. And without having answers, like, there are no gotchas, right? Like, oh, let me ask you a question. Oh, gotcha, right? Like, you don't know something that I was hoping you knew or that you should know. Right. I just want to I want to ask lots of questions and and get very curious about how they think of wealth and how they think of money and what they think in terms of, you know, their own careers and things of that nature. And, and when you get curious, you know, and you invest in that curiosity with other people and you ask lots of quality questions, you're going to find you're going to get a lot of a lot of it's going to get reciprocated. Not all of it. Right. Because, you know, you don't control a lot of the other contexts of where these kids have come from and what they've learned and what they're expecting and the like. But you know, reciprocity, one of the strongest things between human beings and curiosity, energy, interest, inquisitiveness, they're all highly reciprocated between people and kids are no exception. Hmm. You work with a lot of successful people and powerful people, as you mentioned. How do you avoid outcome bias affecting the decisions of people who have been successful in the past? Tell me what you mean by that. What's the outcome bias that you're referring to? Outcome bias, like in, in the in the Admired Leadership module on decision-making, it talks about separating outcome from... Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So so outcome bias, so, so separating between outcome and process, right? Um, you and I both know that we can have some great outcomes with having lousy process and vice versa. Like we can have great process and have lousy outcome. We don't control the outcomes. We always control the process. And so, so how you avoid some of the biases, you control for what you can control for. And you don't talk yourself in to believing that, in fact, your experience, prowess, and everything else is entirely in control. I don't mean you don't have any influence on the outcome. But that, you know, the, the hardest part about dealing with successful people is they've been successful. <laughs> and so they believe in their own nonsense. They believe these things that have that are just spurious, that have no real correlation to their success. They believe those are the driving forces of their success. And they double down on them, which is even weird, right? And so they continue to do things, you know, I, like I can't tell you how many leaders who, who are successful despite what I would consider to be an abrasive, um, mercurial um, style as leaders, 
And they've actually convinced themselves it's because of they're so harsh and stern that that's what's created their success. And so they double down and they get even as they get more experienced and older and more, more successful, they get even harsher. They get that even, they get even more co coercive. Right. And it's so fascinating. Okay. And so that, you know, they, they learn the wrong lesson um, from, from what I consider to be the wrong, um, you know, uh, outcome. So, so that's the thing you do is you avoid, you avoid being overly committed and, and attributing too much of your own influence to outcome. And you entirely control the thing you can control, which is process. Hmm. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that I, would do. it's a great answer. Yep. It does. So we kind of have a, a catch all of rapid fire questions for you, Randall. If, uh, oh, if wow. You're... This is kind of like speed dating except speed questioning. Yeah, but if you have longer answers, we welcome them. But there's just a bunch of topics I've been wanting these to are ask. These yes-no questions, or are these a little longer than that? Uh, a little longer, but okay. it's right. up I'll to you. I'll try to be as succinct as I can. Do you have any general time management strategies that you'd recommend for busy leaders? That's your speed question? That's yep. the one you want me to do fast? Okay. Um, wow. Okay. So time time management pieces. Um, if if I was trying to, to improve someone's time orientation, the most important thing in, in there is, is you got to start on the hardest things first every day. You can't start on the easy things first. You got to start on the hardest things first. And it just takes a lot of discipline, but it's going to make you so much more productive. And by the way, you're giving yourself a reward because the easy things are going to come later. So you're looking forward to those things. Hmm. And so you really just have to tackle the hard things and you have to know what those hard things are as you look at your priorities and look at your tasks and everything else. That That's where you got to start. And as simple as that sounds, it's the magic of almost every body that's any good at being productive and time oriented, right? The second thing I would say to you is it's really, you know, t about being time congruent with your values. Tell me how you spend your time. I'll tell you what your real values are. Hmm. So you got to look at your time field all the time and say, if I look at this field of time, that is all in my appointments and all my commitments, like, is it truly representing my values? What I say matters to me. Okay. And if it does, then kudos to you. And if it doesn't, you need to make some change. Great answer to that question. Uh, th this one's probably also not going to have a, a, a short answer. <laughs> what, what, what do you think makes an effective meeting? An effective meeting, we know exactly what the outcome we're looking for. We've mm -hmm. already agreed as to what the goal of this meeting is. We know we're making a decision. We know we're about discussing things to generate an idea. You know, we, we know what we know what the goal or the outcome we're looking for is, and we're going to basically make sure that before we conclude this meeting, it's absolutely perfectly clear what our next steps are. That, and there's a lot of other things that make for great meetings, but you know, if you did those two things alone, that would be a big, big plus. That's a great answer. What are some of the biggest impacts in a post-COVID world of fewer face-to-face -face meetings and more of these virtual type relationships? So what we know is a couple of things, and they're surprising. Number one is people really are more productive when they set their own boundaries. People get more done with, with, with higher quality when they're in control of their time, when they work and where they work. No question. The problem is that two things become missing. One is the relationship and cohesion between colleagues and between leaders and the people that they lead gets frayed or fragmented so that people are out of mind. They don't get thought of for assignments. They don't get thought of for promotions. They don't get thought of, period. And then second... It's impossible virtually, remotely to get as much feedback because most of the feedback we get are through nonverbals of eyebrows and facial expressions and things of that nature. And so we don't get enough of it. In fact, don't forget when we get on these Teams, Zooms, calls, Google Meet calls, we stare at our own image more than we stare at anything else, right? Mm -hmm. So we're not even seeing the other person very much. So in the process of that, those are the two things we have to make up for. And we have to figure out a way to make up for them. Right. And um, there's lots of alternatives, but you asked me for speed, you know, kind of stuff. But, um, uh, you know, that's the consequence. So so I want people to have flexibility, but I also need to create more relational cohesion. And um, and I need a lot more feedback that, that, than what that that medium allows us to have. Hmm. You mentioned people being more productive when they set their own boundaries. Are most people self-motivated? That's a really good question. It's not one that I have a great answer to because I live in a world where of self-motivated people. So I, you know, I'm probably the police officer that only sees crime. And then I think everybody's a criminal. Um, yeah. In my world, most people are very self-motivated, but 
probably not true, but I don't have a good good lens on that one. What I can tell you is you have to have at least a modicum of self motivation, otherwise you don't get anything done. That that creates the discipline to even get out of bed in the morning. Um, and there are some people that lack that for sure. Um, but 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 what I might say is this: there's a difference between A players, B players, and C players. And A players are highly self-motivated and only need a goal. That's what makes them A players. They just need a direction. They just need to know what you're after. And they will figure it out. Hmm. And they are highly motivated to figure it out for whatever reason. Okay, um, Intrinsic motivations, extrinsic ones, you know, rewards, whatever it might be. Um, we know that the best players are self-motivated. So I don't think there's anybody that's too self-motivated is what I'm getting at. And so anything you can do as a leader to foster, promote, encourage self-motivation, um, I think is is part of your job. So you you, you acknowledged or, or mentioned that you have some serious selection bias in the people that, that you deal with. W- what do you think motivates that sample, the, the ultra-motivated people? Hmm. Uh, that's a, that's another great question. I mean, what motivates them? And, and, I, and I think my answer is going to be a little different than you expect, Right. So, yeah, there are some people that are very much coin operated that are motivated by compensation and other kinds of rewards, right? No question. And there are some people that are very much motivated by the self-satisfaction they receive by lots of positive feedback and encouragement and so on and so on. But I'm going to tell you that the people that I deal with the most and that that makes the most impressive is they have a tremendous desire to improve, to be better. Mm -hmm. And their learning orientation is what makes them so different. And they're motivated to learn, not so much to reach outcomes. They, their, their notion is, if I'm not getting better, if I'm not learning, and if I'm not engaging and recognizing more things about what's happening both to me and everybody else, then, then, I'm, then I would lose the desire to do what I'm doing. And so they are learning machines, and they're self-motivated to learn more than they are toward outcomes and other kinds of in, mm-hmm. intrinsic even or, or, other, or other kinds of rewards. I really like that answer, partially because I got some confirmation bias. What one of my <laughs> benchmarks? I don't know if I've ever thought about it as something that motivates me, but I I always want to be able to look back to a previous point in time and be embarrassed about how little I knew about something that I now know about. Right. Yeah, it's a great one. You know, not knowing what you don't know is pretty pretty big deal. Second to last question, Randall. Uh, can you talk about what you see happening in the next 12 months for your company, Admired Leadership? Well, we're excited about Admired Leadership. As you know, we write field notes every day um, and they go out to tens of thousands of people and that's great. And and those are those are free to anybody, admiredleadership.com field notes, right? Um, and we love our platform and our coaches. We continue to hire more coaches and train them up and we're having more success with our behavioral view every time. We are probably the largest coaching firm of full-time employees in the U.S. We don't know, but we suspect what we are. Um, but the thing that I'm most excited about is we have a digital coach that's about to come out. Oh, wow. And that digital coach is informed only by our data. That is by our field notes and our transcripts to, to our webinars and our conferences and those kinds of things and our white papers and things that have been happening inside our place for years. We think our answers and and our content is better than everybody else, just like like you know, I hope we do, but we really think it's different. And so, this digital coach, which has a snarky attitude, by the way, which I think is really fascinating. Um, we call him Alex, and it might be her, right? It's a gender neutral name, Alex. And Alex, when you ask Alex a question, Alex uses our data to give an answer. And and here's what the other cool thing about Alex is when you ask Alex a, an, a question that doesn't have an answer that's any good that our data is not good. It'll I'll get the question and then I'll 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 create the answer and then we'll go in our mm-hmm. database. So it's going to get better and better over time. I think it's going to replace a lot of simple, it's going to be a great tool. Mm-hmm. Our own coaches can't wait to get their hands on it. Um, and it'll be part of, you know, our platform and things like that. So I'm excited about an AI digital coach that'll get more better and better. Initially it'll just be text and you'll be able to select from six voices, but it'll eventually over time have an avatar and you'll be able to interact with it as AI develops. Like we're, we're as going to be as cutting edge as we can initially. But again, if you use any other AI device, it's going to pull from the entire world of the internet, which is why it gives you such mediocre advice. The advice is all solid, by the way. It's just not, it's just not interesting. Right. And it gives you too much of it. So, you know, our stuff, our digital coach, Alex is, you know, exciting. He's going to, he, she's going to come out here shortly. And, and I'm 
I'm anxious for it and, and hopefully mm. it's a big splash. That is very cool. I'm a big fan of your field notes and I believe you write most of them, right? Most of them. Excellent. They come out every morning. They're fantastic. Our final, final question for you, Randall, how do you define success in your life? Well, I have, I'm, I'm a lot of influenced by people that I've asked that same question to, and I've changed my view of what counts as success drastically throughout the course of my life. And the thing that has, has created my success, you know, or my definition of success most frequently, or, or excuse me, most recently, um, and by that, I mean the last 10, 15 years, it goes like this, right? If you ask the majority of very established, very, very successful leaders, what defines success? They will unequivocally tell you it is how many people they matter to. So how many people, not that they used to influence, not that they once had impact on, but how many people do they matter to right now? And so that to me sounds just, it just resonates with me and it just makes too much sense. And so I've started to gear the way I think of my own success and the way that I think about how I want to be successful in the future about how many people can I really matter to. Now, I don't mean matter just in terms of influence. I want to have a relationship with people. There's a reason I don't write books, right? There's a reason that I don't, I don't I'm pretty much, I mean, I'm not even on social media. I'm not even on LinkedIn, right? I don't want people to find me, right? And it's not because I enjoy my privacy, although I do enjoy my privacy. And it's not because I'm scared of haters, although you know, haters, I can't even imagine. I haven't had any haters yet, but that's just a matter of time. But what I really value is relationships, real interaction, real conversation between real people. And so how many people can I have real conversation with that I really matter to? That not only value my advice and counsel, but value my me as a person and that I matter and I value them. And so that to me is success, right? And the more, the better. The more we die with, the the more successful we've been. And very few people look back in their lives, truly at the end of their lives and say, you know, I should have, you know, tried a different strategy. You know, I, I, you know, I should have spent more time investing. I should have, I, like, very, it's all relationships that, that, that become the foundation for how they define themselves and find us that define their success. And, and I've learned from them and I agree. It's a beautiful answer. Randall, this has been an incredible hour. Thank you again so much for joining us. No, oh, pleasure. Thank you for having me. And and um, anything I can ever do for you guys, you just got to ask. Thanks, Randall.